Our journey to India started on a grey, drizzly morning at London's Heathrow Airport. Very good morning. Where's my breakfast? Seven o'clock, bang on time. Hello. Hello there. Good morning. Hi. Delhi. Delhi. That looks like strange. I'm pouting. That's it. That's lovely. Sweet. Yeah. Your mind's my sister. How long's the flight? Eight hours, 35 minutes. So here are your boarding passes. Okay. It's going to be gate number nine. Thank you very much, Alison. Thank you very much. Cheers. Have a time. See ya. Bye. Bye. Our flight was en route to New Delhi, India's capital city, which is where we'd spend the first few days of our expedition. There would be lots to see as India is about 13 times the size of Great Britain, and its varied landscapes include everything from mountains to jungles and deserts. There would also be plenty of people to meet as India is the world's second most populated country, home to over one billion people. Yeah. You can feel the heat Woo. and the smells and it's busy. I'll tell you what, let's get back to the hotel, get the shorts on, have a shower and we'll actually get some sleep, I think. <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. a good plan. But we weren't long in our beds. From first light, Delhi is buzzing with people and we wanted to get amongst them as quickly as possible. Fresh, clean and ready to explore the capital. I'm going to go off in this. It's called an ambassador cab and very plush it is too. Meanwhile, I'm going to be exploring in this little thing. It's called a motor rickshaw, a cheap way of getting around and much more fun. If a little hairy at times. Right, Nadine? Not to be outdone, I'll be taking a more traditional route on one of these. It's a pedal rickshaw and there are literally thousands of them in the city and they're powered by the sheer leg strength of people like Usman here. Thanks, Usman. I'm going even more traditional still because of by far the cheapest and in many ways the easiest way to get around a place like Delhi is on foot. Let's go. Let me know if you want me to take over. It's a little bit hot. Oh, we arrived. We'd started our journeys from the old part of the city where generations of Indian communities have lived for over 3,000 years. As you drive around the city, one of the first things that catches your attention is the fact that you're sharing the road with a high proportion of animals, especially cows and bison. That's because 80% of the people who live in India follow the Hindu religion and to them the cow is a sacred animal, meaning they're the kings of the road and everyone else has to just dodge around them. Watch the tyre. I've never ever seen driving like this before. It's quite extraordinary. We're the drivers here on the busy streets of Delhi, let each other know that they're there is by beeping. Uh, but the thing is, everybody beeps all of the time, and to be honest, it doesn't really have much effect. Even the lorries encourage you to beep. We're just behind one here that says horn, please. Give me a toot. Thank you. The reason lorries say horn on them is because English is an official language in India, along with 17 other official languages and thousands of dialects. Many Indians speak their own language first and English second. While the others are zooming around, I'm exploring the back streets of the old city, and although it's incredibly packed, it's full of amazing sights and loads of different smells. Many Indians make their living by selling a whole host of delicious snacks by the side of the road on a stall much like this one here. Ek porita please. This is a porita which is a really tasty snack and it costs 10 rupees which is about 12p. And you can have it with a whole host of different sauces and foods. I'm going to try it for now. Green 
gross. And there's loads of vegetables I don't recognise. This is a bitter gourd and it's really bitter. And that's just normal gourd there. And there's all sorts of different things. Look at these little tiny aubergines. They're so cute. And this is the dreaded green chilli. It's very hot. You can even tell they're hot just by smelling them. To escape the overcrowding of the old city, Usman headed for New Delhi, known for its wide open roads and public gardens. Perfect for cooling off when the temperatures hit 45 degrees, and the place to experience one of India's most unique traditions. Although there's a lot lesser than that, you can't come on a visit to India without checking out one of these. It is a snake charmer, and as you can see, they still draw a pretty big crowd. As the charmer plays his flute, the snakes appear to dance to the music. The only thing is, snakes don't actually have any ears, so they are effectively deaf. They dance because they're actually following the movement of the charmer's pipe as he waves it around. Which means, in theory, anybody should be able to charm the snakes. And I have my very own flute here. Jam, do you mind if I uh, have a little go? You've got a longer pipe than me. <laughs> ah, face to face with a king cobra. We'd be returning to Delhi later in our trip. So like most travellers to India, we decided to meet up at the city station and catch a train to one of the country's most treasured monuments. Well, they certainly are busy, these train stations. Oh, yeah. hey, it's great, isn't it? Now, India has a superb train system, so it's a very popular way of getting from one end of the country to the other. Now, uh, we've got our tickets here, but even if you have tickets, you're not guaranteed a seat. You're joking. What? But, yeah. because we're in for the long haul, I've pre-booked some bunks. Good yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Get nice some sleep one, as well. Woohoo! This one. Come on, after you, Con. Off you go, love. See you later. Here we go. Bye. Well, we're finally on. I have to say, Matt has done very well because this is really rather comfortable. It's a seven hour journey, and I intend to sleep for all seven hours. Good night. Hi! We were travelling south to the city of Agra, and our guidebooks had said the journey would be worth it. If there was ever a reason to get on a crowded, stuffy train, then this is it. This is Agra's Taj Mahal. The Taj Mahal stands on the banks of the river Yamuna in Agra, which was once the capital of the Mughal emperors who ruled India 400 years ago. The name Taj Mahal means Crown Palace and is a shortened version of Mumtaz Mahal in whose memory it was created. Mumtaz was the beautiful wife of the fifth Mughal emperor, Shah Jahan. The emperor was deeply in love with his queen, but tragically, Mumtaz died giving birth to their 14th child. The emperor was so devastated by her death that he built the Taj Mahal in her honour, burying her body deep inside the mausoleum. And to this day, the Taj remains a monument to eternal love. The whole complex took 22 years to build, costing nearly 400 million rupees, that's 4 million pounds, using 500 kilograms of gold, that's the same weight as about eight men. Construction of the Taj Mahal began in 1631, a year after the death of Mumtaz. The Shah employed 20,000 skilled craftsmen from across the empire. Legend has it that their hands were cut off after it was completed to prevent them from making a copy of the building for anyone else. Agra is still home to thousands of stonecutters who carve marble using the traditional methods employed by the men who constructed the Taj Mahal. The white marble is dyed red using henna so that they can see the design clearly when it's scratched out. Once it's carved, it's ready for the semi-precious stones to be inlaid. 
This skilled craftsman is producing each petal for the flower exactly the same but without using any design or measurements. And his fingers are completely smooth. They've been worn down from using this machine. The Taj Mahal stands on a huge marble platform, eight meters high. It is also perfectly symmetrical, which is an even more incredible feat when you consider all the measurements were done by hand. In another brilliant piece of design, the four watchtowers around the edge look straight, but are actually leaning out by a few degrees, so that if there's ever an earthquake, they'll fall away from the central dome. When the Taj Mahal was completed, Shah Jahan was intent on building an identical copy in black stone for his tomb on this site. The lavish design of the two mausoleums was intended to dominate the landscape for miles around. Although work started on the foundations, the building was never completed because Shah Jahan was overthrown by his son, Aurangzeb. Aurangzeb was power crazed. He raised an army and went to war against his father in order to take control of the empire. Shah Jahan was captured and imprisoned at the Agra fort across the river from the Taj Mahal. Cruelly, the only view from the Shah's chamber was that of the masterpiece he built, the resting place as beloved wife. But there was some kind of happy ending, as when Shah Jahan died, Aurangzeb agreed to have his father's body placed inside the Taj Mahal alongside Mumtaz for eternity. It's easy to see why thousands of people from all over the world flock to the Taj Mahal every year. The beauty and intricacy of the building is mesmerising, but more importantly, as poet Edwin Arnold once said, the Taj is not just a piece of architecture, as other buildings are, but the proud passions of an emperor's love, wrought in living stones. The Taj Mahal was going to take some beating, but our expedition had only just begun. In the next part of our trip, you can see our journey north to the Corbett National Park in the foothills of the Himalayan mountains, where we go in search of India's largest animal, the Asian elephant. It's one to watch that one, isn't it? It certainly is. We had a great time. Now you can read even more about us.